welcome back to a very special live edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am honored and pleased to welcome our guest onto the show today. He is currently running to be the next leader of the Green Party of Canada, uh, and he has graciously accepted an invite onto the show to sit down to talk about his leadership, his style, his campaign, some policies, but also his co-leadership with uh, former leader Elizabeth May, Jonathan Pedno. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Great to be on the show, Chris. Well, Jonathan, let's get the big question out of the way so that way I can get into some policy talk because that's my favorite part. And that is, Jonathan, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Boy, that is a big question. <laughs> Look, I mean, I grew up I grew up with a single mom uh, in, in on the south shore of Montreal and uh, – you know, my 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 grandmother was a very present figure in my life. She uh, she 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 hails from northern Quebec, from a place called Bac Saint Jean. Very devout Christian, uh, and all of her life, I mean, she spent she spent the very little money she had to help people, whether as it was as a union organizer, as a, a, a politician. She uh, she was uh, very active with uh, the nationalist uh, Parti Québécois, uh, which. You know, we we had some big disagreements there, her and I. But she was uh, she was always someone to put uh, the you know the greater good ahead of her own uh, personal uh, gain, and she uh, she instilled very strong uh, values of, of of generosity, but also of uh, of activism uh, in my life from an early age. Uh, so uh, so I mean, that was very much present in my family and throughout my childhood. The need to give back, the need to recognize that. Uh, regardless of how much we have being born here in Canada uh, brings about forms of privileges that other people on the planet do not have. Uh, and it's important to take care of that privilege, but also to, to use it to, 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 do, to do better, to do good out in the world. I, I, I usually follow up with you can give back in many different ways, whether through nonprofit, whether it be through volunteerism, but Let's be honest, your resume is one for the books. You have given back in many different ways, whether it be through work in Africa, whether it be work around the world. You are uh, a unique uh, entity when it comes to people on my show. But you've decided in 2022 to give back politically. You've decided to run for the leadership of the Green Party of Canada uh, and be a co-leader of the Green Party of Canada with your running mate, Elizabeth May. Take me through the process of deciding to run for the leadership of the Green Party of Canada, Jonathan. Look, I mean, uh, as he said, I pointed out that I've spent most of the, the past 14 years working abroad. So when I was, you know, when I was 17, I, I crossed into Darfur with Sudanese rebels because I wanted to highlight the, the tragedy that was happening in, in, in that part of the world and did a documentary. And that led me to more documentaries, journalism than human rights reporting. And in February on 23rd, well, no, 24th of February, I was... Uh, I was uh, in my living room following the news in Ukraine. I was working with Human Rights Watch as a conflict and crisis researcher and received a colleague, uh, sorry, received a text from a colleague of mine who had just gotten into Kyiv the, the, the previous day. He was, you know, hunkering in the bunker of his hotel. Uh, the bombs had started to fall and he, he asked me, uh, you know, dude, can you bring your flag jacket and helmet to Warsaw in a couple hours? I uh, need you and, and other colleagues into Ukraine. So I I packed my bag. It was 3 a.m. where I was at the time uh, and uh, got onto a plane and then uh, crossed over the next, uh, well, the next, in, the next day uh, into into Ukraine with uh, with a colleague of mine. And uh, so I was there during the first 10 days of the conflict. And that was a, it was a very powerful reminder, not that I needed much of one because most of my careers been spent in crisis areas, but it was a powerful reminder of the fact that we currently currently live in an extremely unstable world. Uh, and when I computed that next to the fact that we are also faced with uh, an extreme threat, that of climate change, which requires global action and global solutions, because it is a global problem, uh, seeing this fragmenting of our international order very, very much scares me. And uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pessimist, and I'm one who likes to plan worst case scenarios. I think that is the primary job of government, of government 
uh, and looking at uh, our situation here at home in Canada, where we've had for the past eight years a government that's been repeatedly behind the curve on most of the crises that have been affecting Canadians uh, and has not been doing nearly enough to address the climate emergency. Uh, I thought it was time for me to come back to, to this space that gave me so much Canada uh, uh, without which, you know, and again, I want to reemphasize, you know, I grew up with a single mom who uh, struggled financially and yet I was able to make it out into the world. And that is a testament to the opportunities that growing up in, in this country uh, provides uh, someone like me. Uh, and it was important for me to come back because I'm, I'm scared. Uh, and I know a lot of people are scared. I'm scared about, uh, about the future. We are faced right now with the, with the massive configuration in, in Europe, uh, something that people in our generations have never known. Uh, you know, if, if you weren't born uh, uh, before the Second World War ended, and you, uh, you've never, that's something you've never seen on such a scale. Uh, and, and, um, and we're faced and here at home as well with more and more uh, clear examples of the types of calamities that await us if we don't deal with the climate crisis. Uh, so I'm scared for, uh, for my future, for the future of, of, of uh, I don't have kids, but I'd like to have some at some point. And, uh, uh, and I would want uh, to be sure that they uh, will be able to enjoy the same opportunities as I did uh, growing up. But unfortunately, uh, that is not the case. And I think most of these solutions are political. Uh, and therefore, it was only natural for me to come back. You've decided to jump into the deep end, though. You you decided to jump right to leader. Uh, uh, for those who are watching, please correct me if I'm wrong here, Jonathan, but you've never ran for politics prior to this election. What was it that made you stand up and say, my, my, my background, my qualities will best be able to help the Green parties get back into relevance, but also get back into a position where climate change is taken serious because I think you were right. I am right. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm right, but I think I, I can say this uh, without being uh, yelled at too much, but the climate issue hasn't been a, talked about in the last few years during COVID-19 and people need to start talking about it. So what makes you believe you and Elizabeth may as co-leaders of the green party will be able to make it a national issue once again? I'll start by saying, I mean, I don't think it's any secret to any Canadian that the Green Party's been in a state of crisis for roughly two years. Uh, the good news is I'm a crisis expert. <laughs> I, all of my life, I've been I've been heading straight into war zones. So, uh, you know, and I've been negotiating. I've been I've been uh, I've been managing teams of journalists, notably in, in the Central African Republic and in South Sudan, whose very lives were. Uh, were on the line and we managed together to build uh, strong teams to operate in these very extreme circumstances. The Green Party, of course, is not faced with uh, a civil war, uh, an internal civil war, but there are and there have been issues uh, with management issues, governance issues. Uh, we've seen some of these uh, these issues pop up onto uh, the national stage uh, recently. And I think it's important to have uh, people who have some experience in negotiating conflicts and managing conflicts and reducing conflicts to take part in, in the rebuilding of this, of this part. Uh, but my experience, I mean, I've, you know, again, for the past 14 years, I've, I've had the chance or the mischance, depends on, you know, depends on the day I've had that, but uh, I've had the, the opportunity at least to, uh, to, to, to witness the very, you know, to be in the, in the belly of the monster. Uh, my first time in Africa, again, was, was when I was 17, was to, to chat uh, in order to cross with these rebels into Sudan. And, and we, uh, you know, that was in 2008. Yeah, 2008. We went to Lake Chad, which used to be one of the largest freshwater bodies in Africa. Uh, and it was already, I mean, we went on an island that was 10 years old. That island was 10 years old, and it was created because the lake is is uh, evaporating because there's less and less water in that lake. And now, when I look, and I was working recently on Boko Haram and, and it, you know Islamist groups committing uh, mass atrocities in the Sahel, and looking at satellite images of the lake, I mean the lake is almost gone. It's almost disappeared. And of course, very clearly, you know, from the very get go, I, I saw how climate impacts 
the daily, you know, the livelihoods of so many people, and it pushes them to the extremes. And and when that happens, then people get mad, they get angry. Uh, that turns into political crises, that turn into conflicts, that turn into more displacement. So, and that's that's been uh, very very visible through most of my work, whether it was in the, you know, in Central America, in South America, in, in Africa, or you know, as far as places like Afghanistan, which of course has been at war for many many years, but it, which is also experiencing a lot of climate stress. Um, I'm able to communicate these things to Canadians. I think I think there's a need for. Uh, for a thorough understanding here at home of the risks that we're faced with. Uh, we're a tiny nation, huge in territory, but very small population that sits on top of an awful lot of resources, including water. And it so happens that our closest neighbor is also a place where I've worked as part of my work as a crisis researcher, because the United States is in a state of crisis. Uh, we're seeing division, we're seeing, uh, we're seeing how extreme and polarized the force is south of the border. And this also poses a threat to Canadians. This is something, this is part of the many packages of threats, accumulating threats that we have to prepare for in order to maintain uh, the, the, the privileges that we have to live in, in, in this country, a country that's been at peace. But, but I don't think we can, I don't think anyone can take anything for granted. And if you doubt that, just go and ask the Iranians because not too long ago, they did take their stability and their peace for granted. Uh, and now they're, they're on the front lines. I want to turn to the climate crisis here in Canada. Uh, as the leader of the Green, as the potential future leader of the Green Party of Canada, you will be going up against Justin Trudeau, Jagmeet Singh, Pierre Polyev, and you will need to break through the political talk with Canadians and get them to understand that this is a crisis. We see droughts that are happening here in Alberta. Farmers weren't able to grow their crops properly last year. We saw the fires that ravaged Lower Mainland BC last year. We see the fires that are currently going on here in around Canada. Um, if not now, when? If not who, who? So I've got to ask the question, what can we do now? What policies do you want to see put in place today to help start tackling these issues? Because while we are a small nation, like you said, large in territory, we are one of the biggest polluters in the world. That is not one of, but on the top 10, I would say, polluters in the world of uh, CO2 uh, uh, gases. How do we start? What's the first step that you would do if you were in the House of Commons talking to Justin Trudeau today? I think there are two tracks that need to take place at the same time. The first is reducing our, our, our own uh, emissions. Uh, and that can and needs to happen by stopping the subsidizing the oil industry and slowly shutting down business and industry in, in Canada. Uh, right now, TMX, which of course is being built uh, with our taxpayers' money, uh, is is uh, is a fantastic, phenomenal subsidy to private businesses, uh, and most of the investors and owners of these companies are foreign. Most of the profits are going outside of Canada and are not staying in Canada. I was in the past five years. I was living in Norway, which is a country that uh, 40 years ago roughly took the decision to nationalize uh, its oil industry and 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 use these profits in order to prepare for uh, for what's coming. Uh, and that is the second track. So while we reduce emissions, we also need to take into consideration that Canada can do everything it can uh, to reduce uh, to reduce its, its carbon footprint. If other countries do not follow suit, uh, we'll still be faced with uh, with the rising carbon. And so we need to prepare our communities. We need to prepare and protect uh, our livelihoods, and that uh, requires huge investments in infrastructure. Um, the Liberals have been in power now for eight years, and they're, they're only starting to finish their adaptation strategy. Adaptation, of course, is how, how do we face it? You know, in the face of, of, a, of a warmer climate, how do we protect our crops? How do we protect our communities from burning down? How do we make sure that uh, uh, fresh water is accessible to all Canadians uh, in the context of, of uh, warmer temperatures? They're finishing their plan. They haven't started investing yet. Not properly in any event. 
uh, it's crucial, in my opinion, that we start that work now. Uh, again, I, I can't emphasize that enough. The role of government is planning contingencies. And the more you wait, the more you delay, the less options you actually have. And then you get stuck into adopting uh, adaptation measures that can actually hurt the climate more and hurt the environment more. The environment more. Um, so reducing our emissions and preparing for what we know is, is coming. And what did, what is already here, you, you, know, you pointed out, uh, the reality that, that you know, most Canadians now are experiencing and have seen the effects of a, of a disturbed climate, not just in BC and in Alberta, but also in Quebec and Ontario and the Maritimes. Uh, it's important that our communities are safe and uh, that, that, that we in, invest in the infrastructure that needs uh, that is needed to keep them safe. Okay, but I'll, I, I'll I, add I, another thing. Uh, okay, yeah. Add that, then I want to play in that sandbox a little bit more, and I have a follow-up question sure. with you. Yeah, I mean, I'll add a bit more. I mean, we've had uh, we've had several governments uh, since since the '90s, you know, who have been promising to reduce inequality. What we've seen now is a rise in inequality. There's a lot of anger in this country, and of course, it's feeding into the Poilievre phenomenon. People are fed up with. Uh, these, uh, you know, the liberal, good-minded, woke, etc., uh, politicians who come into power promising greater inequality, uh, but all of it is talk. And in reality, a number of people are struggling economically throughout this country. Uh, this poses the risk of greater disenchantment and and uh, cynicism towards politics and our institutions. Now, I want to emphasize this. When you're going through a crisis, you do need institutions. You need functioning institutions to, to protect communities, to protect individuals. If you start attacking these institutions, then, then you run the risk of, of chaos in the middle of a crisis. And that's the last thing you want. Uh, so it's so crucial that we address the question of inequality because the, the, more, the, more, the more these, these inequalities grow, as they've been doing throughout COVID and throughout the sadly, throughout the, the liberal uh, government period, uh, the more the more people get angry. Uh, and uh, they join the bandwagon, people like Poliev, who are keen on destroying our institutions. And that is that is extremely, extremely problematic. Uh, uh, as the Alberta show, I would not be doing my job if I did not follow up on your first statement there about ending subsidies to the oil and gas sector. Um, I now, I guarantee you there's at least one conservative politician who listens to our show on a regular basis who's about to send a nasty email to me and say, you're going to cause, uh, if you're elected the Green Party leader, you're going to cause people to lose their jobs in this province. You are going to destroy the economy of Alberta and Saskatchewan. And I, I'm playing devil's advocate with here, John. This is not me saying it. This is, I, I'm, I'm the neutral of perspective here and you're the, the you're the guy a candidate um what do you mean by uh close up shop and subsidies to the oil and gas sector are you saying people are going to be losing their jobs here in the oil and gas sector in fort mcmurray in northern alberta or is there a transition that you're looking at can you just flesh that out for me so that way i don't have to field a lot of calls <laughs> the first thing i say is uh is that we're we're using spares money from all over the to subsidize an industry that, of course, pays a number of people very well in Alberta and throughout the country. That's, that's great. But pays very little dividend to the state of Alberta and to the state of Canada. Uh, when, especially when one compares to the profits that these companies are making, and especially now, uh, given the turmoil in Europe. Uh, again, I've spent five years, the past five years in, in Norway, which is a country where the oil industry is. Uh, partly nationalized. The profits come back to the Norwegian people. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, our liberal government has approved uh, has approved uh, ex an expansion of, of uh, or has, has given licenses to exploit oil uh, of the coast of Newfoundland to a company called Equinor. Uh, and Equinor is the Norwegian state. Uh, so now that's very great and I'm, I'm very happy that there will be uh, you know more Economic and new economic activity in Newfoundland, and that is certainly uh, 
a good thing and good news. But I do have to question why it is that uh, our oil will profit the Norwegian taxpayers, right? While we use our own taxpayers' money to help rich people get a good trip. I think there are alternatives to that. And one of them is making sure that the profits that our current oil industry uh, generates are reinvested into, among other things, preparing for this disturbed future that we know is not, and investing in infrastructure. Uh, this is what I mean by ending these subsidies. We need to work ways to transition off the, this, this economy, and that will require time. I, I'm not suggesting, and nobody at the Green Party is suggesting that from, you know, from tomorrow, from the day we get elected, that all of these people should lose their jobs. The last thing I want is to see more inequality in this country. The last thing I want is to see more people struggle. Uh, this is not what I'm sure in politics. Uh, but I do question the logic of having most of the the profits of this this, this destructive industry uh, come back into the, the pockets of private individuals while these are our national resources, while we've invested billions of dollars over decades into that industry using taxpayers' money. Uh, this is what I, I can't, can't see. It's a change. Now, again, Alberta show, so I have to follow up here. We have a premier right now, Premier Jason Kenney, who has said uh, the energy industry in Alberta is the greenest, it's the safest, it's the most environmentally conscious uh, oil and gas in the entire world. Instead of buying it from dictators like Saudi Arabia and uh, Venezuela or Colombia, we should be buying it here and utilizing our resources here. What do you say to that? Because it seems like, and I, I agree, we do need to transition off of it, but it can't happen tomorrow. Like, I, I, I think you and I both agree that if we do it tomorrow, there's going to be a massive collapse in our economy. From my perspective, I could be putting words in your mouth. What do you say to a premier, Jason Kenney, who says what our industry is the greenest and it's the safest and the most environmentally conscious in the entire world? At the end of the day, there is no green there is no green uh, oil industry. Uh, at the end of the, there are there are levels as to how uh, polluting certain you know certain certain uh, parts of the world and their their industries how how polluting they are. Uh, I you know the the oil sands in Alberta are, are not the greenest form of energy. Uh, most certainly not. Uh, that has been. That has discussed and proven repeatedly. Uh, we've seen the destruction of a number of lakes and, and, uh, and, and the pollution uh, that's been spreading uh, in North America. Uh, but I do understand the fact that uh, right now it still depends on uh, not only for profits, but also to the economy. And that is, uh, that is a testament of the failures repeating, repeated governments uh, invest in creating, uh, in transitioning our economy. Also, uh, we have a lot of other forms of energy in this country. Uh, electricity is one, of course. Uh, we have the potential for wind farms, we have the potential uh, for other forms of, of energy which could replace uh, the oil that is currently being consumed by Canadians. But unfortunately, there has been a lack of leadership here. Um, and that is what we're, you know, that is what the Green Party is, is trying to. To achieve and, and feel that that gap currently exists in uh, proposing these alternatives, but not just proposing them, but also, uh, of course, investing. We could probably stay on the climate crisis for the full hour, but I we have other issues that are important to Canadians as well right now. And you touched on it briefly here for a second, and that is the inequality. We are seeing the gap between the middle class and the upper class, the low, the uh, people struggling to get by, people are living paycheck to paycheck. COVID-19 has not helped that. How do we address this? How do you see your leadership addressing this issue? What are some of the policies that you're looking at to bring in to say, here's how we start addressing this issue so that everyone is getting a fair shot, but also everyone is getting a fair shake at potentially getting ahead and moving from uh, to living paycheck to paycheck to being a middle-class uh, Canadian? 
think that's an issue that's very uh, that's very close to me and close to home for me because my, my mother was struggling not me as I grew up right I know I know what it means to uh, uh, to receive the calls of uh, debt collectors uh, having to struggle to uh, uh, pay rent at the end of the month uh, or pay for groceries at the end of the month. Uh, that's, that, that's a reality that I've, I've lived. And of course, a number of programs uh, that help uh, people in, in such circumstances, such uh, conditions uh, throughout the country right now are run by the provinces. Uh, the federal government certainly has a role to play here. The Green Party, for many years have been looking for a, a guaranteed minimum income. Uh, what is a guaranteed minimum income? It's a, it's a basic income that, uh, that that is paid to everyone throughout the country, a single universal individual that is delivered through the tax system. That means that people like my mother, uh, back in the day, who was struggling because of, because of health issues, uh, do not have to stand in queue uh, for hours to ask for fill a number of forms and uh, you know, ask for the pity of the state. Everyone receives the same amount, regardless of income. And that is something that actually allows people to either set money on the side or use that as, as one of their primary uh, source to pay for the needs of rent and all. Uh, but certainly something that also contributes to uh, the general economy of the country. Something that uh, we believe can be a solution to the rising uh, inequalities in this country. But of course, that also needs to come with a higher tax on uh, people who earn uh, high incomes throughout the country. Okay, I do apologize for interrupting. You're starting to cut in and out right now. I'm not sure if it's your microphone or if it's something else. I, I'm just going to take a quick pause, everyone. We'll be right back in about two seconds once we get Jonathan's audio working better here because it was cutting in and out. So just two seconds, everyone. We'll be right back. Sorry about that, guys. That's the great thing about doing these live. Sometimes you do have issues, and here we are. Uh, Jonathan, we were talking about the inequality issue here in Canada, and uh, um, there's a lot of people who are struggling right now, and that's because of inflation. Inflation is a topic of a lot of people's mind. You're seeing that at the gas pumps. You're seeing at the grocery stores. You are seeing it everywhere. The day-to-day -day lives are getting more expensive. How do we address inflation? While we can talk about uh, the uh, equality issue, inflation is the big one. What are some methods that we need to start putting in place to make sure prices don't go higher than they are and potentially start seeing some uh, relief at the grocery store when it comes to groceries or relief at some of these day-to-day -day items that people need? I think the first, the, first, uh, the first thing we need to talk about is where, where does this inflation come from? Because we're hearing uh, Pierre Poilievre, among others, blame it all on the liberals and blame it all on internal factors. The reality, of course, is that uh, after COVID and with COVID, we've had a number of people who haven't had, uh, you know, who, who did not consume as much as they would otherwise have. They accumulated money uh, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, society was reopened, uh, provinces reopened their, their economic service sectors, people were able to go back to work uh, the way they could before uh, before COVID and, and spending resumed uh, at a time when, of course, COVID had also disrupted the chains of supply worldwide, not just in Canada, worldwide. Uh, meaning that there was a shortage of uh, a, a very clear shortage of uh, of raw stuff, but also uh, an inability to uh, you know to to transport a number of of uh, of, of uh, commodities. That is also, and that very much highlights the fact that we live in a global, connected, interconnected economy, uh, and the more reliant we are as we've been now for decades on products that are produced abroad, uh, 
the more we will be faced with uh, rising costs that depend on issues that we don't actually have control over. Uh, the Green Party for a very long time has been talking about food sovereignty, about the need for us uh, in Canada to be able to consume what we grow at home and for us to be able to be, uh, to be more resilient to these economic shocks that come from abroad. Uh, I think that requires strong leadership from the federal government, but it also requires us to look at our economy in a different way. Uh, you know, the system that we live in right now is one that squeezes people uh, from the time that they get to school uh, until the time that they that they die. Uh, it's one where uh, we're constantly required to study more in order to hopefully make more money. But in the process of doing that, we're getting, you know, we accumulate debt to pay for, for our university fees. Uh, that debt needs to be repaid, meaning we can't actually accumulate money in order to buy a house. Uh, by the time we are able to buy, a, you know, potentially able to buy a house, the prices are going up. Um, and all the while we just work, work, work 40 hours, 50 hours a week, while probably having children who also require their own activities on top of that. So we're just being squeezed for time and money from every possible direction. And I think one thing that Canadians probably saw during COVID was that the economy slowed down significantly and people were able to spend more time with uh, their family, with their children, with their parents, uh, their friends. And if we are to live uh, a life that is more sustainable and that allows us to take the right choices uh, for the environment and for ourselves and our communities, notably by potentially cultivating our own food, if, we have, if we're so lucky as to have space to do that, uh, by cooking our own meals, as opposed to buying ready stuff, ready-made stuff, uh, by, uh, by, by being active in, in our communities, that all of these things demand time and time we don't have so much of in this current economic system. So I think there is a need to redefine and ask ourselves, what is, what is the better life? What is the, what is, why, why are we doing the things that we're doing? Uh, is it to only accumulate money so that we can potentially, but maybe not buy a house where we'll just live unhappy and, and you know, hooked up on, on antidepressants as so many people do, or is it to live a meaningful life with the people around us. And so that, 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 that shift requires, uh, that, that shift, that ability to live a better life requires economic reforms, which uh, the Green Party will, will work on, on pushing forward. And one of them is, is, the, uh, is the, the, the basic, uh, the guaranteed livable income, which allows for that shift to happen. Do you think people are ready for that change? Do you think people are willing to accept that change and start having that conversation of what is a better life? Because <clears throat> the, the the we have seen over and over again, we have done the same thing over and over again, it's hoping that something's going to be different. Do you have hope that Canadians are finally waking up to the message and saying, okay, we need to do it better. We need to have this conversation of how can we do things better? Well, clearly, we're seeing already, and you know, in this post-COVID recovery period, that people are are hoping for uh, for for a di for a slightly different life. I mean, a, a number of people who were allowed to work from home have no intention or desire to go back into their offices now. A lot of people who were able to work remotely and perhaps from smaller communities outside of the larger towns, where they have more access to nature and fresh air, and perhaps you know, an ability to actually have a little garden and, you know, spend more time with their kids. I think people, people's perception of what is needed for a good life is changing. And that is the result of, of this, this massive uh, disturbance to our economy that COVID has been. Uh, now it's our job, I think, and the job of government to, 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 to have these discussions with Canadians and, and truly ask, you know, what, what, how, how can our economy serve our lives as opposed to our lives serving an economy that is becoming increasingly meaningless for most people because most people aren't able through this economy to make a living. Uh, we are coming up on the second anniversary of the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Day in Canada. Um, 
indigenous people from across Canada are still finding uh, unmarked graves of uh, children who were forced into residential schools. Canadians have failed the indigenous people. I, I, I think I can say that point blank. How do you envision your partnership with the indigenous people of Canada moving forward? I think the first, the first, the first and key point is, is, uh, is that one needs to start from a face of great humility. And, uh, there's, I still have myself a lot of learning, uh, to do, uh, and that learning I've, I've tried to engage with various people, uh, who have indigenous background who are involved in the green party of Canada and th by visiting various communities, uh, as I've done on the West coast, uh, very recently. Uh, there is, I think, I think we, that, that needs to start from a place of humility and understanding, uh, from these communities, what, what exactly, uh, they, they would, they would like us as settlers to do. Um, recently I had, uh, I had a very interesting experience and, and one that was very eye opening to me, uh, in, in the Montreal Metro for, uh, a man from, from, uh, Nunavik, which is the Northern part of Quebec an Inuit man uh, was, was experiencing uh, some sort of a crisis. And, uh, and most people in the metro were getting extremely uh, annoyed and pissed and wanted the police to be called because he was, uh, he was preventing the metro from moving forward. But nobody engaged actually in a, in a conversation with him. And, I, and so I tried and eventually managed to uh, ex have him agree to come outside the metro and have a cigarette with me so we could discuss. And, and, so, and so we did that. Uh, and the metro was allowed then to proceed as, as, uh, as it needed to. Uh, but it really, uh, it really impressed upon me the fact that uh, there is a great divide. There is a great lack of understanding and mutual uh, trust between uh, uh, the settler community that I'm, I'm a part of and most Canadians are a part of and some of these communities who feel unheard uh, and who feel disrespected and I felt was disrespected for now centuries uh, and abused. And on the other part, a, a, a settler community that is starting to reckon with the damages that their ancestors and the system that we live in have done to these communities, but still engage much more in performative acts than actual true reconciliation. That true reconciliation demands that we change as well, not just that we apologize. Uh, and so far, I've seen very little of these changes aside from our governments pledging more money here and there. I think we need to have a proper discussion as to how as a nation together we will move forward and i think there are several good examples throughout the planet of countries that have done better than we have and new zealand of course being one of them we i shouldn't say we but the government prides itself saying that they are helping the uh indigenous communities across canada but and i say this and i think everyone knows where i'm going with this we still have First Nation reserves. We still have settlements that are on boil water advisories. In Canada, one of the freest countries in the world, we have co uh, communities that are on boil water advisories. We have failed, haven't we? If there are still communities like this in our own country. Oh, it's complete. I mean, <laughs> to say that we failed is, uh, is, is, is almost as to say that, you know, this wasn't done by design to some extent. We forced communities from Quebec, from northern Quebec, to move to Ellesmere, and that is now Greece Fjord. They were, they were tricked by the RCMP in the 1950s to move to a place where they had no food and had to spend one or two winters, if I recall well, with no access to food. Uh, these were hunter-gatherers who were used to hunting caribou. There is no caribou on Ellesmere Island. And they were dropped there and tricked there because we needed to assert as a nation, we needed to assert our sovereignty over that piece of land. Uh, what we see right now is, you know, and these the lack of the lack of water in so many of these communities, these reserves that are uh, in a state of, of in a state that is reminiscent of so many of the places that I've worked in, uh, in, in you know, in, in, in Africa or South America. Uh, these these communities are in such a state because there has been repeatedly a lack of any interest for, uh, for our, our indigenous uh, brothers and sisters. 
And, and I think that is starting to change. I think there is a reckoning taking place, but that reckoning needs to take place in coordination with a, a true desire to listen to what these communities want, not just an expectation from our part of what it is that they should have, right? Uh, and that we should give them. Because when there is a give take relationship, there, there is a continuation of that power dynamic, which has been so destructive for so many years between uh, between the colonial state of Canada and these communities. I want to turn to the Green Party of Canada now before, and this is going to be the last segment before we start wrapping up here, Jonathan. And that is, what are you hearing from the membership from coast to coast to coast in this uh, country from the Green Party membership? What are they looking for in this leadership race? They're looking for stability and renewed, uh, renewed leadership. What do you mean uh, by stability? Well, clearly, again, I mean, you know, as we discussed uh, early on, the party has been experiencing a number of crises. Uh, these have played out very publicly in the media. We've lost a number of donors. Uh, we clearly have some uh, governance issues that need to be uh, that need to be resolved. Uh, we have volunteers and members uh, who basically held the party together. Uh, for the past two years, and all most of these people are unpaid, and most of the, these people have been working extremely hard, dedicating their spare hours or their time as retirees or students uh, to help keep this party alive. Uh, but they're tired. It's been two years, and they're looking for inspiring leadership that can not only uh, stabilize things internally, because again, you know, with with so many people working so hard for so long, people get tired, people get emotional, and then disputes can sometimes start to appear. And we, you know, we, we're certainly experiencing that. Uh, so they're looking for that, but they're also looking for growth. They want to see the party, uh, the party grow from coast to coast to coast. They want to make sure that we have a, a better presence in uh, francophone communities as well. Uh, and that, that is why there was a a desire to make sure that all the party, you know, the leadership contestants could uh, could speak French. Uh, that was very much criticized, I know, by a few contestants. But I, I as a Quebecer and as someone who uh, has French as 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 his uh, mother tongue, I, I see that as an important an important step um, towards demonstrating that the Green Party of Canada is relevant to Quebecers. Um, so they're looking for stability and growth. And that's why I think my collaboration with Elizabeth uh, is so powerful. The fact that we're able to not only have her experience and her baggage, but also her position in the house. She is a sitting member of parliament, but, I'll, but, but then my ability to hopefully grow the party, stabilize it internally, uh, travel from coast to coast to coast and continue the work that our interim leader has has started to reunite the party. I think that is a winning formula for uh, for the Greens. You talk about the collaboration between yourself and Elizabeth May. What will that collaboration look like? Because if you put two people together in a room, they're not going to agree on 100% of the issues. So if you and Elizabeth, um, the uh, MP for Sanders Gulf Islands, disagree on an issue, how is that going to be resolved for, and it's not going to be spilled out into the uh, media and then look like the uh, Greens are in disarray again. How will that collaboration work so that way the benefit of the party will always be the first? I mean, the first thing I'd say is that Elizabeth and I are, are, two, are two very different, uh, yet complementary people. Uh, you know, our, I have a number of, of, of weaknesses. Uh, I'm, 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 an, I'm very much an introvert, which is not great for politics. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, I, get, I, I love meeting people and I love shaking hands and smiling, uh, but I get very quickly exhausted from it. I need to, I need to retreat listen to my music you know elizabeth thrives in the public and she's she's great at it um but she's also someone who talks a lot and with my background as a journalist i'm someone who prefers to ask questions uh and listen and try and find solutions through questions so i think i think you know in terms of our respective personalities and strengths uh, i think we complement each other uh, quite well for for the good of the party we've established uh, a very good relationship, Elizabeth and I, over the past three months. I've spent many 
many nights uh, sleeping on her couch, uh, having coffee with, uh, with her husband, John, uh, taking her dog out for, for a short walk. Uh, but we've also had, uh, you know, very strong discussions on policies and on, on where we stand. And the great thing and the amazing thing, and that was certainly a bit of a, a surprise for me as well, because I'm, I'm quite, uh, I'd, I'd say I'm, I'm fairly, I'm fairly far on the left, you know, on, on, on the left side. I think uh, I, I, I am very much a progressive and there's been, you know, here in Quebec, but also in other parts of, uh, of Canada, a, a belief perhaps that Elizabeth is uh, a bit of a centrist, perhaps even a bit of a conservative on certain issues. But, uh, but the more we discuss, the more I found out sometimes that she's even more radical than I am. <laughs> uh, uh, but wasn't or wasn't or didn't feel comfortable expressing her own opinions um, as, as, as leader of the Green Party of Canada because uh, your role as a leader of the Green Party of Canada is to represent the membership and to, to, uh, to, to bring forward the policy, the amazing policies that our members have been, have been, have been working on so hard for, for many months or many years. Uh, so how do you we, balance that? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interject here for a second because I want to jump yeah. into on this question. If you talk to a Green Party member in BC and you talk to a Green Party member in PEI or downtown Toronto, you are going to get a completely different uh, response on certain issues. How do you balance that out? How do you balance the the Canadian green vision with the regional greens that there are? Because if you talk to someone here in Calgary about their green, what a green party mem- uh, looks like, it's going to be different from someone else. So how do you balance that out? Well, again, we have we have policies that have been adopted by members, and I think they can, you know they clearly they constitute the basis on which uh, this party. Uh, advocates not only in the House of Commons but also in our public de- declarations. Uh, at the end of the day, the role of the leader, the, you know, leaders have their own personal opinions on a number of things. We wouldn't do politics if if we didn't. Uh, but our role as leaders is then, if we do have specific views or specific ideas about specific issues, is to push uh, these ideas forward uh, during our our general meetings uh, of members, where these can be discussed by members and voted upon. Uh, the Greens have a platform and the Greens have policies on numerous issues. I agree with most of them, but there are some issues on which I, I don't, you know, I'm not necessarily convinced or, or uh, and, you know, but this is a party that has the membership at the top of the food chain. Uh, they're the ones who decide and our job as leaders is to represent them in the house and, and be as good uh, a communicator as possible to sell these ideas to Canadians and make sure that Canadians understand that these ideas are, in many ways, our best way forward in the in the context of this climate emergency. Uh, again, I just want to come back to this. Elizabeth and I have had disagreements on a number of policy issues, uh, but we talk them through. We have a, a memorandum of understanding between the two of us, but we're also which which clearly delineates what our areas of responsibility will be uh, if we're so lucky as to be elected as, as the next leaders of, of, of the party. And these uh, areas of responsibility will be very clearly communicated to the membership and to uh, and to the structure of the party so that there is no uh, no uncertainty as to, as to who is responsible for what. And right now, uh, Elizabeth, because she is a sitting member of parliament, because she is in parliament and able to push uh, our policies uh, in debates with Trudeau and Poliev and, and, and Singh uh, will continue to do that work with the status, her, a status as co-leader of the Green Party of Canada. She'll be able to address the press from Ottawa and push uh, our key policy recommendations in the political debate in Canada. My work until the next election will be to rebuild the party, will be to make sure that we have, uh, we have a governance that works for the members and make sure that we have uh, new, new excited members who are willing to join us and that we're ready to stand in the next election with a full slate of candidates and strong candidates who are active in their communities.
So just a clarification, and then I'm going to start wrapping up here, Jonathan. You said until the next election. Are you ruling it right here, right now? You will not run in any by-election in any situation if you are elected leader or co-leader of the Green Party of Canada uh, in October or November, depending on which one uh, the membership vote more than 50%. Yes. Uh, I will not be running in a by-election. Not until, no. The art so you, we have, you, the next, the only time you'll run is in the next election. Yes, and the reason for that is because first and foremost we have Elizabeth in the house right now and Mike Morris, but also because we have we have a big job to do as leader to rebuild the party, to fundraise, to make sure that our membership uh, and our EDAs are prepared and equipped with with the right tools to make sure that we have more Greens elected at the next election. That requires time, and as a sitting member of Parliament, you don't have that time. You just don't have that time. Uh, so now by splitting the work between Elizabeth and I, we actually have a, a very, very uh, impactful combination of someone who's outside of parliament and able to do this political work to prepare for the next election and someone who's in parliament who's able to push uh, for, uh, for green solutions in parliament. And that's how we're planning to divide the work until, until the next election. And at that time, when the election time comes, uh, Elizabeth and I will uh, be proposing to the membership uh, who they, you know, who we think should be leading the campaign on the national stage. That is a decision that we'll submit to the members. Uh, members will be able to decide who the primary spokesperson for the party uh, should be and will be uh, during election period. Well, I want to thank you so much, Jonathan, for sitting down and doing this. Uh, I know I said 45 minutes and we're past the 45 minutes mark, but I want to ask this last question before we do wrap up. I guarantee you there's someone yelling at their screen right now watching this or later on when they're rewatch listening to this and asking, why didn't you ask this question? Well, it's my show and I get to ask the questions I believe are important. So... Jonathan, how can people reach out to yourself? How can people get involved? I know membership cutoffs ended on the 14th, but uh, memberships are coming up for the next one if uh, because the first round of voting is going to be narrowed down to four. So how can people reach out? How can people ask you a question? And how can people take out a membership? Uh, well, I mean, we're still looking for volunteers. We're still looking for donations. I have a website. It's Jonathan. Pedno, P E D N E A U L T. I know it's a complicated name. It's uh, it's in the show notes, everyone. For anyone who doesn't want to try and write that down, scroll down in the YouTube notes, and it's right there. <laughs> yeah. So there's a yeah. So I have a website, and my my email address is jp at jonathanpedno.ca, uh, and I'm really excited to be connected and get connected with as many people. I'm I'm someone who welcomes question. Uh, I'll do my very best to answer them uh, as you know in as timely a fashion as possible. Uh, with the caveat that, of course, this is an actual campaign, so running a little bit around. But uh, but I, I I've I've been uh, been talking to a lot of members, a lot of Canadians uh, so far. I'm super excited to do my best to serve this country as best as I can. Well, I want to thank you so much for Jonathan for taking time out of your busy schedule and your campaign for sitting down and talking to us for the last hour. It's been a wonderful pleasure to have you on the show, and thank you so much. Thanks, Chris. I hope uh, I hope we have more chances to talk in the future. When you're out in Alberta, we will certainly have you on again. Um, so with that, as I've said on the show and every closing, put down social media for at least five minutes a day, everyone, and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our democracy, it helps our society, and helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been a very special live edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day, and remember, everyone, keep talking.